Hey guys, today we're doing Investing 101, The Basics. Super important to get you started on the right path, or if you're already there and you just want to learn a little bit more. My name is Rob Tatro from robtatro.com, head of the Tatro Wealth Advisor Group here at Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management. If you want to talk with me and have a little chat, go to www.speaktorob.com. We'd love to book a no obligation consultation. And if you have any thoughts or comments, please post them below. All right, so investing 101. Let's get started right away. So first of all, types of accounts. You guys know this, but when you start saving money, you're either gonna put money into a bucket. And I wanna differentiate, it's important for me to differentiate between types of accounts, types of investments, and product types. All those are three different things that people sometimes intertwine and, and mix up. People will say, I have a GIC, or I'll have an RSP, or they'll intermix those two. In reality, you have different accounts. So the accounts are generally a non-registered account. That's usually going to be either a cash or a margin account. So if you invest in this account, these are after-tax dollars. The income being generated is taxable, and you will generally get a T3 or a T5 for the income that's being generated with those investments. Typically, these happen only after you've kind of maxed out your RSP and your TFSA. Speaking of RSP and TFSA, those are two other account types or buckets. On the RSP, you could do a personal RSP. You could also do a spousal RSP where I would contribute the assets to my wife's account and I would get the deduction, she would get the assets. The tax-free savings account, contribution room, accumulates every single year as long as you're an adult and you're a Canadian, uh, allows you to grow that tax-free. You guys know how that works. I've done a video on that. Feel free to check that out. You also have a corporate account, a corporate non-registered account. Um, you could also do IPPs, an investment uh, IPP account or an RCA account. Those are also accounts that you could do as well. Let's move to the types of investments. So the types of investments are traditionally the types of asset classes or investment, stocks and or otherwise known as equities or fixed income, otherwise known as bonds. And here at the Tatro Group, we're a big believer of alternatives. So an alternative asset class, which is neither stocks nor bonds, generally private debt, private equity, private real estate, something that's traditionally uncorrelated to the movement of stocks and bonds. Inside of bonds, you typically have preferred shares, debentures, an actual bond, so an obligation to pay. You could have a principal protected note in there. You could have private debt. Those are traditionally kind of fixed income. On the stock side, you would have Canadian, US, global equities, companies that trade on a public exchange. Product types, let's talk about product types. So I can decide to invest in bonds, but I can decide to invest in bonds, which is a type of investment, and I can choose to do it in multiple different product types. For example, I could invest in a mutual fund that owns bonds. So we've done videos on this as well too, but it's an important concept for people to, to try to grasp. Where each of your different types of investments could be a different product type. You could also, another product type would be an ETF, an exchange traded fund. So you could buy the mutual fund, which generally is managed by a third party. Generally, the fees are gonna be higher. Um, the tax consequences are shared across the entire base, so you don't get any custom uh, access or custom tax treatment there. The ETF is similar to a mutual fund. Typically, fees are cheaper. Management is typically more streamlined. Or you could actually own the investments directly yourself. So same thing with the stocks. You could have mutual funds, private pools, ETFs, you could own the assets directly. There are also limited partnerships that exist. These are all kind of investment types that can hold some sort of, uh, of different investment itself. Investing 101. By the way, guys, if this is something you'd like to chat with us a little bit more, please go to www.speaktorob.com. We'd love to book a no obligation consultation for you. So I'm going now to what are you investing for? So this is the planning aspect of the thing. I'm a big believer that the moment you have that first dollar that is going to sit in your bank account for, a, you know, for any kind of period of time, call it three months at least, that dollar should be invested. Whether you're 18, 25, 45, or 55, that dollar should be invested. Now, I understand that you do need to keep cash flow in your bank account, enough cash in your bank account to fund your month-to-month -month cash flow, I get it. But any dollars that are not going to be used for that, that should be invested. And what are you investing for? This is the kind of ultimate planning discussion. Are you investing for your retirement? Are you investing to just to make sure that you have capital 
when you're 60, 65, that you can then draw down on. This is the traditional investment model in Canada and North America is we have earning years. So during those earning years, we save, we accumulate, either through a pension at work, either through an RSP, or either through a tax-free savings account or a corporate account. You save, you invest, that money grows, and then when you stop earning income, you would then draw on that in retirement. Where you draw on is an effectively difficult and usually complicated question where you definitely need some planning for that. We are big believers of planners here because we've seen so many times where people are either melting down their RSP in the wrong way, or they're drawing from the wrong account, or some tax decisions that they're making are having significant negative impacts on their wealth. All right, so what are you investing for? Maybe you're investing for, a, you wanna leave a legacy, you have certain targets that you wanna to leave to your kids, perhaps it's for your favorite charity. Um, regardless what your purpose is in investing, it's important for an advisor, and I would say for you, to actually understand why you're investing. If you don't understand why you're investing, you need to just take a step back, pause, and have that discussion with the person you trust, your advisor, or someone like us, and try to figure that out because it's an important part of investing 101. Risk, let's talk about risk very quickly here. So risk traditionally was, you know, if you were an adult, you had a balanced portfolio and that was that. You had 60% in stocks, 40% in bonds, and good luck to you. Hopefully the stocks do well and hopefully the bonds do okay. I think that concept of risk needs to be thrown out the window because of what's happened in the last 30 years with respect to interest rates. Risk and volatility are not the same thing. Risk, to me, is the likelihood of an investment, whether it's a stock or a bond or a, or a limited partnership, going to zero dollars. The risk of you losing kind of all or significantly all of your money in that investment. Volatility, on the other hand, is the day-to-day, month-to-month, year-to-year movement of that asset class. Risk, asset goes to zero. Volatility, day-to-day movement of it. They are not the same thing. Most people are comfortable with a fair amount of of risk, but not a fair amount of volatility. And how do we manage for that? We believe in owning quality assets that first of all have effectively as little risk as possible. We wanna own no assets that might go to zero. It's just not what we believe in. We don't speculate. It's just, it's, it's not something that's for everyone and very few people truly get that concept. On the volatility side, we also manage assets to reduce volatility. And how do we do that? uncorrelated asset classes to markets. We take a look at stocks that have lower betas than traditional equities, and we like to shore up portfolios in time when the markets are high and add to equities when the markets are low. That's something that, it's a a risk reduction and a volatility reduction strategy that you should have in place. If you don't yet, you should take a look at that. Diversification of your portfolio. We've done another video on this, but I think it's extremely important to diversify your stocks, your equities, and your fixed income and your alternatives. So first of all, you wanna diversify across different asset classes. So stocks, bonds, alternatives. You want them to move in an uncorrelated fashion to one another so that if one asset class is up, another might be down or vice versa. And second of all, inside of each asset class, you wanna be diversified. Geographically, for example, for sector growth and value in your stocks, you wanna have a whole bunch of different types of fixed income, whether it's private debt, you know, mortgages, debentures, bonds and your alternatives, you know, private equity, private real estate, uh, income notes, anything that is going to not move in unison. So that is proper diversification. And finally, on Investing 101, let's talk about fees. So fees are are something that most people are, are, generally they don't see it, you don't see the fees. So if you own a mutual fund portfolio in Canada, your fees are, are somewhere in the higher end of the global fees for for money management, because you're paying a fee both to your advisor, which is typically called a trailer fee. This is generally about 1%, and you're also paying a fee to the money manager. So the money manager might be the name of the mutual fund company that you own. These mutual funds are effectively trust units, and you own trust units of that fund. You're paying one kind of inclusive fee to the fund company, which then pays a trailer to the advisor, and they keep the rest for themselves. Mutual funds in Canada could be anywhere from two to call it 3% generally, two to two and three quarters percent. They vary, some are higher, some are lower, but they're generally kind of in that range, most mutual funds. Sometimes you will see the fee being split so that the fund company gets their, call it one, one and a quarter percent, and the 
the advisor gets is 1% or 1.5, and that would be on the statement. Sometimes that happens. Um, so those are traditionally fees on mutual funds. ETFs are similar. They have a built-in fee that's generally hidden, anywhere from somewhere as cheap as five basis points, so 1 20th of a percent, all the way up to you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 basis points uh, for some of the kind of more complex niche type ETFs. Generally, most advisors now that are portfolio managers are operating under the wealth management model, which is a, an administration, a management fee to administer your account, to manage the account, to offer you the wealth advice that you need. So that's a fee that generally goes to the house. For example, the investment firm. In our case, that would be Canaccord Genuity. And then Canaccord Genuity would pay their costs to operate the account you know, the custodian fees, the trading fees, the research, the analyst, etc., And then the rest would go to the advisor and his advisor's team. And then the advisor would pay his team, his overhead, etc., from that fee. We're incredibly transparent with fees. I would love to have that discussion with you because very few people are having that discussion with their advisor about fees. I'd love to have it with you. Uh, thanks for tuning in today, guys. If you want to know more about fees or anything else, diversification, investing 101, the basics, please go to speaktorob.com. We'd love to book a no obligation consultation with you. And uh, I'd love to hear your comments. Feel free to share, give us a like, send us your thoughts. I'm Rob Tatro from robtatro.com. Thanks for tuning in.